let us get started uh, today on our topic. So I am guessing that if you're here, it's because you are interested in this intersection between Agile and UX. This is a thing that uh, has uh, created a lot of friction in a lot of organizations over uh, uh, the last decade or so. And I thought it would uh, uh, be useful for us to sort of take it apart and talk about it. And to do that, I wanna, I wanna talk about this idea of framing. And, and the best way to talk about framing is, is to talk about it pictorially, right? That it's, it's a framing an idea is, is a metaphor uh, but imagine we were using an actual frame. Imagine I had a frame and I was holding it up and I was looking at a little park scene that was happening. Uh, and in this park scene, I could see uh, trees and cars and, and kids playing in the park and clouds and all sorts of things. Uh, however, if I pick up the frame and I pull it closer, I can now see more of what's going on. And I might realize that that park and that scene was actually on a movie set. And I can see the cameras and the lights and that uh, uh, the clouds are just drawn on a background mat and all of these things. And, and it was the act of moving the frame that allowed me to see something different. So when we talk about reframing, what we're talking about is actually taking a different perspective, taking a new point of view, taking a different way to look at a problem and, and um, understand how we're going to solve that problem, but solve it now in a different way than we've solved it before. And this, is, this idea of reframing is important because in fact, Agile, when it was first created, was itself a reframing. It was a reframing of a development process. In the pre-Agile world, uh, uh, development was primarily done through an act of, of uh, what, what folks referred to as um, uh, uh, basically waterfall. There were these stages that, that were uh, uh, put into place. We'd start with requirements and then uh, uh, when the requirements were all done and not a moment before we would do design and when design was all done and not a moment before we would start to code and when coding was all done and not a moment before we'd start to test uh, uh, and, uh, and then once it was tested we could then, you know, deliver the 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 product, the the application, the the software that we were working on, and when the systems were, when the products and things were uh, 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 small, this was not really a big deal. But as the size of projects grew, as the size of applications grew, this became really a, a very large thing. And and the issue was was that. Um, uh, People were being asked to predict way up here at the beginning of the time, they were, they were being asked to predict how much time it was going to take before delivery. And they would do that by making these estimates of, of what the requirements were saying, okay, that's going to be that many weeks. And then design's going to be that many weeks. And they would, they would basically try to, to, to work out the timing of each of these steps and upfront make big predictions. But this turned out to be problematic. And it turned out to be problematic because a bunch of things happened, right? There, there, in order to make this work, there was a lot of focus on process and, and, and on tooling. Uh, uh, there was a uh, massive amount of negotiation over uh, what, the requirements would be and, and what was needed. And that all had to be done up front. You couldn't really get started until you did all those negotiations. There was these, this, these massive plans. I remember being in a project where there was this giant chart that had what everybody was gonna do, this giant Gantt chart. And it was, it was on the, uh, um, the wall, it was on three walls of a conference room. It was so large that it just took over the conference room. And, and, and it was sort of like the Vietnam War Memorial because people would come in and they'd find their name on the wall and then they'd start to cry 
because it was just depressing as to, as to what the work would be involved. Um, and so there was all this planning and, uh, and then there was incredible amounts of documentation that every one of these stages produced documents after documents after documents. And much of the time was spent creating and updating and trying to understand all the documents involved. And all of this caused the deliveries to often be incredibly late, if not outright failures. And there were notable big budget failures in the millions and millions of dollars that were really um, problematic in terms of, of, of uh, how this really never, ever succeeded. And so what happened was uh, uh, a bunch of folks, a handful of folks, about 18 people, uh, who were trying to figure out how to, how to rethink this, ended up going on a little conclave out into uh, Utah in uh, Snowbird uh, uh, about 11, uh, uh, 21 years ago, right? Um, uh, in 2001 and uh, like this week, I mean, it's the, it was like the January 20th or somewhere the 18th, I guess, uh, uh, in 2001, they, they went off and they, they were just sort of trying to figure out what, what could happen. And there were a couple of, of ideas for how to uh, rethink this waterfall thing. And they started talking that through. And, and what we now know is Agile was born out of that. Now, the folks who came up with this, these were folks who come up with these things that at the time they called Scrum or XP. Uh, uh, and that, was, that sort of is what Agile became the basis of. And the, um, the, the difference between Waterfall and Agile is that Agile didn't have these documents. It didn't have these big plans. It, it, it did things much more incrementally. And it was, but it, at the end of the day, it was still trying to do the same thing. We're still in the same landscape. We're just looking at the landscape differently. It was a reframing of the landscape. Now, one of the things that uh, uh, I should point out is that um, back in the, in the days, whoops, I didn't mean to press that, I meant to press this. Uh, back in the days of, of Waterfall, the role of UX was, uh, was not well understood, but it was better understood and that it, it mostly fell in this stage here called design. Now design was both software and, and UX, but we were at this point where we had weeks and weeks and weeks, months in, in many cases, to be able to uh, uh, do work where we knew what the requirements were and we could give something to be coded. And the, that was where the UX work was done. And so I remember back in the, the 90s and the 80s that, that you, there was all this focus on how do we produce great user experiences in this. But the Agile idea, the Agile idea took things differently. What Agile said was, we're not going to plan out big plans. Instead, what we're gonna do is we're gonna break things into little time boxed uh, um, chunks. And each little time box chunk would end with us doing a, a, an evaluation of where we were going. And then we would do the next time box chunk. And the thought was, was that we would basically cover the same amount of ground that we were covering here, but we weren't spending all of it doing requirements up front, then design, then code. We would actually sort of build that into every little chunk and we do little pieces of it. And that's how the agile concept was born, was this, these little time boxed elements. And what was happening in the time boxed elements when we were doing this was uh, uh, we were allowing teams to be more adaptive. They were allowing them to, to try something out and say, is this close to what you want? Are we getting closer to what you want? Are we getting closer to what you want? And 
we uh, uh, in agile, what makes something agile is the ability to sense and respond to any sort of issues or change or learning that is happening. And that's, that was what the, the purpose of Agile was. And the thing is, is that in, in the 20 or so years since Agile uh, uh, was first sort of put on the table and, and proposed, it hasn't really changed. But one of the things that, that it never really figured out was where UX fit in. Right? Where does UX go in this? In the, in the waterfall model, we were clear where UX went. It was part of this design phase. But it, is, it has never been clear as to how UX works. And this has been a, a constant struggle to what uh, folks have been trying to do for a, uh, um, a really long time. And so what we're going to talk tonight is how we might take Agile and once again, reframe it and reframe it in a way that actually allows us to merge it with a UX practice that delivers great products and services. And so that's, um, that's what we're going to talk about. Now, the existing framing of Agile is really focused on one thing, and that is product delivery. At the end of what we want, uh, what we do, we want to deliver project, products. And it does it by breaking products up into small uh, boxes. Now, this is the way you think about it linearly, but you can think about it cyclically. So for example, we can think of a, a scrum process, which is just one of the agile processes. And you know, a scrum process, there's routines and rituals that you do every day. And, and so this, uh, uh, this is our sort of daily scrum. And we, you know, a daily scrum starts with a little meeting in the morning where you, you uh, everybody gets together and says what they're hoping to accomplish. They talk about what the big challenges are, and then they get to work and they and they um, uh, start to to work together. Now, that daily scrum exists in the context of a sprint, and a sprint often is two or three weeks of time boxed work. And you decide up front at the beginning what you're going to try to accomplish in this sprint. You work for those two to three weeks, and at the end, you see if you accomplished it. And that's the idea. But sprints actually occupy a, a bigger piece. They, they fit into a chunk, which is um, uh, a release. Uh, in some uh, agile worlds, they refer to it as an epic. Uh, uh, and a release is basically what you're going to give to customers to use next. So. A release is made up of a bunch of sprints. A sprint is made up of a bunch of daily scrums. But now there's actually a, 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 a sort of bigger chunk of this. And that's uh, your roadmap. So uh, last year, I talked about product roadmaps. And, and a product roadmap is basically a bunch of features you're working on some now, that's your current release, and then there will be other ones that you work on later. And uh, that is the, uh, 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 the, the, that is sort of the bigger piece that releases fit into. And then there's, there's one more uh, level that we could draw here, and that's an overall vision of the product or services that you're trying to produce. So we can, we can look at the uh, agile process as being these simultaneous things. We're trying to achieve an overall vision that is made up of a roadmap, that's made up of a bunch of releases or epics, which are made up of a whole lot of sprints that are two to three weeks long time box, which are made up of a single day daily scrums. And so we have, we have this capability, we, we have this, this ongoing effort and we're, we're 
accepting the fact that this is ongoing, right? The sprint is not the beginning and ending of it. The release is not the beginning and ending of it. We are constantly working on all these things simultaneously. And that's the, the, the effort. Now, when we talk about Agile, Agile measures success when something is delivered. And so that breakup of uh, releases and um, uh, so our, our release would look like this. This is the release, right? It's all about delivering something. And so the way the sprints work is that at the end of the sprint, according to the, the concepts of Agile, is that you're supposed to have a working piece of software. And you always have that at the end of each of these sprints. And the reason for that, the reason that they, that they did that is they wanted something that you could put in front of uh, what they called customers. And you could show it to them and you could say, is this what you want? Now, keep in mind that in 2001, uh, the notion of a customer was not a consumer-based customer, but was in fact uh, a representative of the business. It was a business customer. So it would be a person whose job it is to say, yes, this is the software we're gonna use because a lot of the systems that we were talking about where Agile was coming from are big things like banking systems and travel reservation systems and government uh, 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 systems for immigration or for um, social security. So these were different types of, of large systems. And so at the end of each sprint, the goal was to have something working that you could show a representative of the business and they could say, yes, this is the product we want. This is not the product we want. We are getting progress here. And the goal was to, to stop this problem of those business people, they would give the requirements up here and then they wouldn't see any results until here. And then they'd learn that it wasn't at all what they were hoping for. So the big problem that Agile was trying to solve was that at every step, you were getting some sense. And if, it, if you'd gone in the wrong direction, you, would, you could course correct. You could say, okay, well, let's try a different approach. This, this was not what we wanted. Let's go here and see if when we get to the end of that sprint, we've given you what you wanted. And so that's how we get to this idea of sense and respond. But what's still missing from this equation is UX. We still haven't had uh, uh, a way to do this. And this is because in, in the world of Agile in 2001, uh, UX was not really a thing that, that folks in, the, in that world were thinking about. They, they, they knew that products and services had to have good experiences, but they, they really were not thinking uh, solidly about uh, how you go about delivering user experiences. But here's the good news. The good news is that uh, they accidentally came up with some principles that actually work nicely with UX. So Agile came up with uh, the Agile teams, the, the folks who were in that session at uh, um, snowboard bird in, in 2001, they laid out a, a, a four sets of values. And uh, the values related to those things that they found disdainful about um, uh, uh, about a, a waterfall. And the first value was that instead of process and tools, they wanted to favor uh, individuals and interactions. And uh, instead of contract negotiation, they wanted to focus on collaboration. And instead of large amounts of plans, they wanted to respond to change. 
And this is what they wrote out, right? Uh, instead of documentation, they wanted working software. And so they said, these are the values that we have, right? We're going to we're going to aim for having individuals and interactions over processes and tools. We're going to have collaboration over extensive customer negotiation. We're going to have a response to change over comprehensive plans. And we're going to uh, uh, have working software instead of uh, uh, having detailed documentation. And they, they, they came up with these um, uh, this value to sort of say, look, this is a more agile way of working. This is a more flexible way of working. And the nice thing is, is that those principles of individuals, interactions, collaboration, responding to change, and even working software, these are very human centered. And that's good news for us. The problem is, is that for the last 20 years, we've been so focused on the mechanics of executing each of these sprints and putting that into a release and getting a product delivered that we've forgotten that human centeredness. And that's fallen off the, the, the wagon. So now it's time to reframe Agile with a UX approach and to give us that reframing to get those human-centered aspects back into the process of delivering great products and services. And so that's, that's what I'm gonna spend the next few minutes talking about is how we go about doing that. Now, this idea of reframing is, uh, allows us to keep those original values, which is gonna help us a lot because it'll, it'll restrict the amount of um, uh, resistance that we're going to, to run into. And it's going to allow us to focus on the definitions of quality and value. What does it mean to deliver something that's high quality and high value to the teams? And that's how, how we'll start because that's at the core of Agile. And so we're not actually asking people to do something different. We're asking them to do what they're doing uh, uh, more thoughtfully uh, with the users in mind, not the customers as originally defined in 2001, those business partners, but the actual people who are using it. So to do this, we're gonna, we're gonna look at three aspects of Agile and really strengthen them. And those three aspects of Agile that we're gonna look at are uh, prediction, collaboration, and learning. These are things that are already part of how Agile is taught and how Agile is executed in many places. We just want to actually use it even better. So to start with this, let's talk about prediction. Um, let's start with a basic sprint. So in a sprint, Again, this is you know two to three weeks, depending on on how you're executing it. In most flavors of of agile, um, uh, you're supposed to have a couple of rituals. There's a ritual at the very beginning, which is known as planning, and there's a ritual at the end, which is known as retro. Uh, uh, retrospection or reflection. We we'll call it reflection for here. And the purpose of these two rituals is to define what happens in the sprint. In the planning part of the sprint, you actually, what you're doing here is you're making a prediction. You're trying to predict the amount of work 
that you're going to get done, the team is going to get done in the sprint. And with this amount of work, right, they're going to work for their two, three weeks. That's not changing. So the amount of work has to change. So we try and predict. We look at, we look at what's uh, in the backlog and we say, what are the things that we can get done? What are the things we want to get done? And where do we want to be? And you have this goal that at the end of the sprint, you're going to have produced something that is working enough that someone could look at it and say, yes, that's definitely going in the right direction. That's something that we want. In this reflection piece, you then look back at the sprint and you ask the question, did we get, did we make our prediction? Were we able to get all the things done that we wanted to? And this is how we learn, right? What we wanna look at is say, okay, we predicted that we were gonna get X, Y, and Z done. We get to the end of the sprint. We've only gotten X and half of Y done. We didn't get anything done on Z. And like, okay, we've now learned something. Why didn't we get that done? And what are we gonna do differently in the future? And that's the idea. We just keep repeating over and over again throughout this, this process, this notion of planning and reflection, planning and reflection, planning and reflection. And all this is working towards an idea that there is something called the definition of done. And the definition of done is a solid measurable goal that we can tell when we have achieved what's good enough to release. And we're always measuring our progress in terms of that definition of done. So there's a couple things in our reframing here. One is, is that we want to make sure that our prediction takes into account something that is an improvement for our users. And that when we're learning, we're learning whether we achieve that improvement or not. And that the definition of done needs to be that improvement, which typically means that what we have to do is we have to shift from thinking in terms of outputs, an output being, hey, we've delivered you a piece of code, to being an outcome. We wanna make the shift here from output, outputs to outcomes. And an output is something that we deliver into the world. An outcome is a change in the world because we've delivered something uh, uh, that causes that change. And when we talk about UX outcomes, a UX outcome is an improvement in someone's life, right? If we do a good job on this, how will we improve someone's life? That's, that's an improvement in their experience. And uh, that's what a UX outcome is. So, Part of our reframing now is to say that our definition of done is a UX outcome. And how, what prediction can we make of getting closer to that outcome? So the first place we start is this notion of prediction. Then we wanna make sure that we're always learning. We're learning about how we're working and also how we're getting closer to the outcome. And the third piece of this is that in the work, we're collaborating better. This, this act of collaborating means that everybody on the team is contributing to the outcome. Now, one of the traps that I see lots of folks run into is that uh, 
the first reaction of going into the set of sprints. So we have our, you know, continuous sprints. Is that they think that the UX process that used to take months has to get shortened and shoved into this. This is a, a mindset problem. This idea that UX, all of UX happens in two to three weeks. And then we start over two to three weeks and we do more UX and we start over two to three weeks and do more UX. And we figure out how do we get all the work that we would normally have done back in the day of uh, a waterfall where we had months and months and months in this design stage, uh, how we get each of that to happen in this two to three week period. And, the, and the, the answer is you can't. There, there's no way to pull this off. Uh, and we don't need to. Because the mindset shift that we need to go through is that UX is a continuous process that actually starts before the project even, even starts and continues beyond the release. And that in this process, we're always learning more about our users. And we're taking what we learn and we drop it into the knowledge of the teams as we go. But not only that, there's another mindset problem, which is not only is that UX has to be done in this period, but it has to be done by somebody who has a title of UX designer or UX researcher. And this mindset problem is a problem of uh, thinking in terms of roles. That there's a UX role that has to be on every team. And uh, the UX role is, is not a thing. Uh, what we want to be thinking about is skills. That there are UX skills. And there's no reason why if we have a team of folks, why everybody on the team can't have some UX skills. Now, UX skills, we can, we can break into sort of three categories. Uh, we can think of UX skills as just basic understanding of UX. We call that literacy, right? That is the ability to tell good UX from poor UX. If you can't tell good UX from poor UX, if you can't tell what's a good design from a poor design, uh, then it never looks the, different to you. And why would you ever choose to go with a, a good design when a poor design is much cheaper and easier to deliver? So you first have to understand the difference between good versus poor. The next piece is you have to have some amount of fluency of, of what it means to deliver good UX. You have to understand what design is. You have to understand visual design and interaction design. You don't have to be the world's best designers, but you have to, you have to know how to predictably get good outcomes by employing the, the skills uh, of uh, fluent in UX. And the third stage is mastery. Mastery is when you become an amazing UX person. And these are advanced skills. And so the reality is, uh, uh, this is how you handle uh, uh, complex situations. We don't need everybody to be masters. We just, we just need the majority of people to be literate and fluent. And so you take the entire team and you start helping them become more literate, more fluent. And suddenly you now have teams that 
are capable of, of doing the work themselves. And you know, example is simple, right? We have a developer on a team who learns enough about design that they can take whatever they're doing, let's say it's taking a bunch of fields in a database and putting it into a form so someone can add data and, and explore it. Uh, uh, and their first design isn't bad, it's actually pretty good. What would it take to get them to be able to do just that amount of design? Well, it turns out it's not a whole lot. We can teach people design pretty quickly. And we can do it even better if we give them a, some, a tool like a design system where the, where the design system actually gets them to that point more effectively. So this idea of, of giving people skills uh, turns out to be really powerful. And so that's a key piece of our reframing is that what we want to do is, is change the way that people are working. This old set of mindsets where we're constantly trying to uh, break things into small pieces, this is what we call reactive UX work, right? The reactive agile UX, where every sprint we're reacting to what's come off the backlog, what are we working on? We're treating it as if we've never thought about it before. We push out as, as, as much research as we can. We push out as much design as we can. And we, uh, 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 we're working as fast as we can, trying to always catch up, always feeling like we're doing a crappy job, never quite getting anything out the door that's reasonable. And when we're in reactive mode, we're focused very much on tactical work that is very much about just making sure we build what we're doing uh, um, the right way. So is it being built the right way? When we get into uh, this viewpoint, we now get into proactive Agile UX. And in proactive Agile UX, we are far more strategic. And we're no longer focused on, are we building it right? We're focused on whether we're building the right thing. And this is really much more to the core of what Agile is trying to do. We're trying to understand, are we building the right elements? So by getting the teams skilled up so that they can do the work to do the tactical UX, we can actually take the folks who, have, who are real masters in UX, those people who have you know, often walk around with the title of UX designer, UX researcher, and actually have them be working through the project. And they are facilitating this work, but they're actually working at a strategic level. And it's that process where we suddenly see the difference. In order to make this work, there's basically four uh, uh, things we have to achieve. And uh, I'll share this and then we'll, we'll take a bunch of questions. So if you have any questions about this, put it into the chat and Syra will collect it up and we'll, we'll answer your questions in just a bit. So the four things uh, uh, for Agile UX is we have to start with continuous, continuous, let's wait, UX, research. So we are, we're not thinking of research as being discrete uh, uh, pieces of uh, work that are a luxury and teams say, well, we don't have time for research. So we're just going to make guesses because the opposite of doing research is guessing. Uh, uh, we're not going to, we're not, uh, we're not going to 
accept that anymore. Instead, we're going to build a research program that is continually learning about who the users are, what the users need, what they're, uh, what they're trying to accomplish, what their challenges are. And so we're always building this sort of continuous UX research element. The second piece to this is that we need solid UX metrics. I talked about UX metrics a few years ago uh, uh, for this group. Um, uh, we need the ability to uh, establish UX outcomes. You know, if we do a great job on this, how do we make, uh, 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 how do we improve somebody's life? Uh, that's a UX outcome. From that, we create success metrics that tell us when we've achieved the outcome and progress metrics that show us how we're doing. And when we have those metrics, now we can see in every sprint, we can start to see the progress that we're making and we use the definition of done. Where did I put the definition of done? Here it is. Uh, we can use the definition of done. That's our success metric, right? When we've achieved that. So we need, we need metrics in place to make all that happen. Then on top of that, what we need is to have uh, increased team capabilities. And this doesn't happen overnight, uh, 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 but we can increase the, the team capabilities for UX uh, by uh, uh, bringing more skills into the team uh, as a regular part of the learning process that's going on. And then finally, what we want to have are uh, what we call uh, uh, audacious UX goals, which is we want to not just be trying to make things incrementally better, but to have a solid target, uh, a flag if it were, that we were all trying to march to. And uh, that flag is defined by a vision that we then build a roadmap to that uh, will, over multiple releases, produce amazing results. And we'll use those audacious goals to uh, motivate the entire team to increase their capabilities, to use their metrics to determine what's done and to really rely on the research uh, uh, that uh, we're continuously doing. And that's how we achieve um, uh, our agile UX uh, transformation. These are the four things that we focus on. And I have now worked with a whole bunch of teams that have made real progress in each of these things. And they are seeing tremendous, tremendous improvements in the products and services that they're delivering. So this, this process, it's hard, it's not simple at all. Uh, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. But it is in fact, uh, quite doable. And it's these four elements, building up a continuous UX research capability, putting in solid UX metrics, increasing the team's UX capabilities and creating audacious UX goals. And that's what I came to talk to you about. We're gonna take some questions. Uh, Syrah has been collecting them up, but before we do that, uh, there are a couple things to talk about. One is that uh, uh, for those of you who weren't here at the beginning, uh, this audacious UX goals thing, we have a whole workshop online on this uh, uh, that we are um, uh, uh, giving at Center Center UIE, where I work, we're giving next week. And if you want to be part of that, uh, I, I encourage you to join us. It's free. Um, there's a paid track if you're interested in really sort of starting to implement this that has some train the trainer elements and, and some real problem solving pieces, but all the materials on how to create outcomes, how to create an experience vision that, that guides the team, how to create a UX roadmap that, that works, all of that happens um, 
in this intensive and that's next week in our leaders of awesomeness program and so if you want more information michael just posted a link to that uh feel and syra did too uh feel free to to join us uh for that so that's i want to invite you to come to that program if if this is something that's really of interest to you um and so that's key i know that uh joe has an announcement as does peter uh or i guess ed from from gbcacm so uh joe uh uh why don't you uh tell us your what's happening at at boston kai all right thanks jared um so yeah just wanted to uh recap that this is a um a joint event by boston kai gbc acm and uh ieee um, we do this every year, even since before the pandemic, uh, way back then. And um, yeah, thanks everybody for coming out tonight. I'll tell you a bit about Boston Kai if you're if you're new here. Um, we're a nonprofit volunteer run organization um, focused on human computer interaction and um, committed to supporting the local community. So if you like what we're doing, you can become a supporting member. You can uh, come and help us uh, put on the show here. And um, yeah, our next event is going to be February 8th. We're going to do a noontime uh, seminar with Paul Khan, uh, who will talk about the COVID project. So it's about uh, visualizing COVID data. Um, very timely, relevant, and uh, should be great. So yeah, thanks. And I'll, I'll turn it over to, um, to Ed. Uh, hello. Um, so. Uh... I have a, uh, oh, I, it's, I'm speaking in an official capacity. So let me see, let me put my uh, official face on. Okay, um, my name's Edward Friedman. I'm the uh, chairman, chairperson, or what we call the president of the Greater Boston ACM chapter. That's the Association for Computing Machinery. And I'm also, um, here we go. And I'm also a member of the IEEE Computer Society but I don't hold any position there. Um, some of you may know that Boston Chi is the local Boston chapter of Sid Chi, the special interest group of, uh, on computer and human interaction of the ACM, the Association for Computing Machinery. So we've, uh, we've always looked at as Boston Chi as our, our um, you know, sister organization or I don't know if there's a gender appropriate term there. Uh, we are siblings, uh, but we tend to do more general, uh, if you were here in the beginning, more general kinds of topics, everything from computation using DNA and synthetic biology. We have a talk coming up in uh, February on that, February 24th, I believe. And, uh, things having to do with uh, communications technologies and computer languages, and we get a little bit more nerdy. So um, though I am not a, uh, by any means, a uh, user experience designer, uh, I've learned much from Jared over the years. And on behalf of Boston Chi and the Greater Boston ACM chapter and the IEEE Computer Society, we want to thank Jared for his insights, his wit, and his longstanding support. Uh, we want to continue to encourage his, uh, his behavior and uh, uh, talks like this. And so we are presenting him with, excuse me, <clears throat> with a gift certificate for $100 of wines of his choosing. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, that helps encourage your behavior. Uh, let's see, on a more personal note, uh, taking off my official hat, uh, on a more personal note, I would have to say that attending so many of your talks, Jared, over the years, you have sharpened my gaze and my appreciation of, of both good and bad user experience design, even to the point that when I uh, arranged to get you your gift certificate, I found myself critiquing the website. 
<laughs> so uh you can yeah, it's uh, a curse it's a curse ed yes yes i'll <laughs> never look at the world the same way again so thank yeah, you yeah. once again and uh turning things back over to um uh your uh your uh, uh support staff to handle q a thanks again if, if i uh um really wanted to curse you i i teach you how uh kerning works and then you know you you'd <laughs> You'd never be able to see the world the same. Um, uh, okay, uh, Miss Syra, how are you today? Good. How are you? I'm doing well. I should mention that uh, tomorrow is Syra's last day with us. She she she's been with uh, Center Center UIE for six months. Uh, she's just finishing up her internship. She is looking at her next opportunities. Uh, <laughs> if if your organization is looking for someone with amazing UX and marketing skills, she is she is a a a person to talk to. So uh, uh, if you're interested, let me know. I'll connect you up. Ah, uh, but Miss Syra, uh, uh, as one of your final acts, you get to <laughs> questions. So who should we talk to first? Thanks, Jared. Um, I think Rami has a question. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, but they're asking in reactive agile UX, how important is the rotation and retention of team members involved in previous iterations? Oh, Rami, yes. Can you say a little bit more about where you're coming from on your question? You need to unmute and then. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Hello. Hello. So, yep. So definitely great find coming across this event today. Uh, I'm definitely grateful for being here and learning what we've learned. Uh, so the background and context for that question is really I'm behind a startup that's focusing on building software for construction. And we're very much in the first iterations of developing it. And having learned of the processes for optimal UX processes, we're obviously looking at learning more from the user, right? We're building for them and not the other way around. And so. And that question, what, what I find is that as we're building these uh, iterations, um, I wonder how much the mindset and the biases a team could have when they revisit the project, that they're really looking at it from a different angle. And so I wonder to what extent the rotation of the team members involved really changes the outcome in those iterations to maybe, you know, maybe something someone hasn't thought of before would come up somehow. Up or you know, maybe bringing someone new who wasn't there before, but understands some processes uh, of, of, of optimal UX design or implementation would input something of value. So I just wonder how important the structure of a team is in that essence for how they're revisited. And I'm not sure how valid of a question this is, but it's just kind of a, a thought that's coming to mind about the, the process. Oh, it is very much a valid question. Um... Uh, 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 so it's a good question. And I think you want to separate two things out, right? You want to separate out um, experience and skills because they're, they're different things. Um, you can bring in uh, new perspectives by bringing in people with different experiences. But if you lose key skills, you set yourself back. And so uh, rotating people through or, or switching people up um, will work fine if you have a good distribution of equal skills across the board. So if everybody knows how to, how to do uh, uh, you know, let's pick one aspect of UX is screen layouts. If everybody knows sort of the, the solid basis of screen layouts and it all works the same across, you'll, you'll be in fine shape bringing new people in. And you're right. If you bring in someone in with a different experience, they may think about the project differently, particularly if their experience is informed by other things that they've worked on. So if you have multiple parallel uh, sprints happening, which means you have multiple agile teams working simultaneously, and each one's working on different things, cross-pollinating those teams 
actually allows people who, someone who used to work on one aspect of the experience, who learned from the users, understands how the users think about that aspect. They come over to a different part, they will bring a different perspective. But if in the process of doing that, it sets the team back because the team has now lost critical skills because the person they're replacing has gone to fill in some other seat, uh, uh, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. So you're always balancing that trade-off. And, and part of the job of a UX leader, I think, is to help with that cross-pollination of information. How can we come up with new ways to bring a shared understanding across all the different teams so that we don't have to physically shift people to get those changes in perspective. You can do those things with, for instance, um, good critique. If you have an open critique where every week a couple of teams show off where they are in a design, and it's not critique is not design review, and critique is also not criticism. Right, critique is, let me show you a design we've arrived at and show you the process by which we arrived at it. Let me go through the research that got us to this moment, mm -hmm. right? And how we learned how to do this. If that's shared amongst all the people who are interested across all the different teams, then those experiences are transferable because you might share something. I go, oh my gosh, that changes the way I think about what I'm working on. Does that make sense, Rami? Yep, I think it does. And ultimately, that's the thing, it's the, the sharing the knowledge and, and the common knowledge at that point and just adapting to also how our brains work, to how we react to, you know, when we're in the middle of that process. Now, not to mention, we're talking about a remote team here too, where I think there can be some, you know, but it's more adaptable, that's for sure. But we're also kind remote of Remote teams with, have some advantages, yeah. but they have lots of disadvantages. You can't put the work up on the wall as easily. There's a lot of things to, you can't, you know, you can't create a studio environment where people are sort of seeing what other people are doing passively without actively being part of it. You have to, everything in a remote environment gets scheduled. Can we have a meeting tomorrow at two to talk about this? And that's, that's a downside of remote work. There's, there's not that sort of non-scheduled serendipity uh, no. um, uh, gets, uh, gets challenging. So that's um, very much a, a key thing. Great question, Rami. Thank you for asking. Yep. yep. Thanks for the input. Thank you. Okay. Syra, who should we talk to next? Um, I think Joe has a question. Um, and so he's asking, how do we measure UX outcomes in improvement to an actual person's life early on before we have users for a product? Oh, that's a fantastic question. Joe, do you want to say a little bit more about that? Um, yeah, so just uh, kind of being in an environment where uh, working on kind of a new product, something that is not really even out in the market yet. Um, yeah, just like, how, how do we know, how do we actually like know we're on the right track if we can't test it, if we can't right. see an improvement in a real person's life, you know? Right. Well, before we do the thing, we can't see the improvement ever, right? So it, it doesn't matter whether it's a new product or an old product. It, 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 the improvement is the thing that is a change, right? So we haven't seen it yet, but we can see the potential for the change. And that's the key piece. So the, 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 the starting point always is to sort of think about uh, the user's current experience. So while this product that you're working on doesn't exist in the world yet, um, they are, they're doing something. Um, uh, uh, can you say a little bit about what industry your product is in? Just so I have a sense. Uh, agricultural technology. Agriculture. Okay. So, so, uh, the customers or users are farmers or they're, uh, p other workers inside the agricultural economic space. Yeah, exactly. Um, a lot of farmers and grain buyers. Okay. Like that. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. That's that. That's good. So let's take let's take a, a a grain buyer. The grain buyer has has a goal, right? There's there's some there's some objective that they're trying to accomplish today, and uh, um, we can think of that as a milestone. And 
uh, they start, you know, their day or their week or their month or their season uh, working towards that by completing a bunch of things that get them to that final objective. Right. And this is true, whether we're talking about grain buyers or we're talking about doctors or, you know, whoever the users are, uh, uh, this is, you know, there's there's some end goal that they're trying to achieve. And we can measure that goal on and, and the steps to get there on a scale of of extreme frustration to extreme delight. And this is before the product exists in your case. Right, but they are still doing this thing. They still have this objective. And theoretically, the reason your product needs to exist is that this is an onerous element. And there's a lot of pieces of this that exist in the frustrating space. And so I'm gonna make the assumption that you are of the belief and your founders are of the belief that, that if you do a good job on this, you're gonna make it more delightful all the way across. And what it is, is it's this space here that's frustrating, that's the most interesting. Because that frustrating space, we can ask the question, well, what would it take to make that more delightful? What would, what would we do? Would we remove these steps and automate them? Would we uh, uh, somehow anticipate what's happening and, and make it easier? Could we use data? Could we use machine learning? What do, could we do here? to make this better. And so whenever we're talking about UX outcomes, what we're really talking about is this delta between the, the current experience and that future aspirational experience. And so while we don't know what the product will look like, while we haven't delivered it to see the improvement in people's lives, we can imagine that we can make it better than it is today. And we can put some words around what better might be like, and that becomes our UX outcome. Does that make sense, Joe? Yeah, yeah, totally. So it's like getting granular into each of these steps of the journey and being able to say for sure that it's crappy now and that we know what we can do to Right, Fix it. right. Yeah. And so the more research you do on a grain buyer or the more research you do on the life of a farmer and you look at, at what their experiences are, the more that um, you'll be able to say, we can get this better. And so there's a way to think about this. There's a, there's a, a schematic that I find myself turning to quite frequently when we talk about this, which is we can think of the current experience, that's that chart I just uh, drew, and we want to think of it as an individual current experience. So, so you have lots of farmers and grain buyers and we're gonna take all their individual experiences and you know, their experience might look like this or like this, right? We wanna take those and, and sort of aggregate them and say, you know what's not unusual is people get really stuck at this stage and they get really stuck at this stage and that's where we're focusing the product, right? And so, so we're gonna we're gonna figure out how to improve the product by, uh, uh, coming up with an experience that's improved. That's the current experience. And we can then take this aspirational thing and make that into our UX outcome, which you know we, we think of in terms of an improvement in that user's experience. Now, uh, and we can then ask the question, well, why, why do those grain buyers, why is it not happening today? Why are they not getting that experience. And that's because there are problems in the world that need to be solved. And this is what your team is trying to do, right? They are trying to solve the problems that those users have in their current experience that will get them the outcome. And as soon as you understand the problems, you can start to build some solutions for the problems. Solutions is a fancy word for features or capabilities. And so it's the solutions that will actually generate the outcome. That's where we'll see the improvement. We deliver the solution, we see the improvement. 
but it is the problems that they're solving, which are informed by the current experience that we really have to understand. And there's an old saying in the design world, which is the great designers don't fall in love with their solutions. Great designers fall in love with the problem. So what we really want to do is get our entire team to fall in love with the problem. What are the problems that grain buyers have today? What are the problems that farmers have today? And the more we can get them to fall in love with the problem, the better off. Now, not, one thing to point out is that sometimes solutions don't work. Sometimes we don't get the outcome. But we always learn more about the problem. Right? Every time we produce a solution, we're learning more about the problem. So it's this iteration, right? This is this is you know basically what the double diamond is in, in design. This is this is key, but we have to constantly be understanding what that current experience is like so that we can be working towards producing an outcome. Does that make sense, Joe? Yeah, definitely. I think that's helpful. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. We've got time for a few more questions here, Syro. Let's take another one. Um, this next question is from Jody, who I hope is still uh oh, Syra, where's you? Yes, going? yes, I am. <laughs> uh, Syra, you cut out. So, so oh, please, uh, can you say, so Jody's here. Uh, can <laughs> you just say uh, what the question was? Yes. Um, how do you help a development team understand that they are not UX literate, literate or fluent when they actually think they already are? Oh, yes. Dunning Kruger effect. Uh, uh, Jody. Yes. To say a little bit more about this, I'm. By the way, I'm an expert in Dunning Kruger. I, I'm glad to hear that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm working at a company. Some of the teams that are currently developing products are doing a wonderful job working with our experience design center, working with the the UX experts, really taking feedback, wanting to be awesome, doing customer interactions, and some of the teams are not. And when you try to give those teams that are really disengaged from the Experience Design Center and all the work they're doing input, it goes to the end of the backlog. They don't want to hear it. They don't think it's important. They think they have the answer. And I like I I'm just trying to get some traction, but I, you know, I can't tell them the emperor has no clothes because they really don't want to hear that, right? Right. Here's the thing about the emperor's clothes. Um the whole purpose is to get an outcome. And if we've got our research capability where it needs to be, and this is the trick, right? We have to have good research in place. They can't fake the outcome. Yeah. Either the user gets the improvement in, the, in their life or that doesn't, right? So that means yeah. that we really have to know that current experience, which they can't, they don't have much control over. Yeah. And we have to understand what the outcome is, which they can pick, right? Doesn't really matter who chooses the outcome, but let them pick it. But they have to achieve it. That's the now the definition of done is they've achieved the outcome. Not that they've delivered the code, right? Yeah. If we let them make the definition of done as the customer asked for data export. We delivered something that was labeled data export. We're done. That's the definition yep. of done, right? That yep. doesn't mean that whatever we delivered for data export is actually useful or usable. Right. Uh, we, have to, we have to determine the outcome. So we have to ask the question. If we do a good job on this data export problem. How much better will it get? How, how, how does that affect somebody's life? Yeah. Okay. okay. And so you really have to understand the problem. And here's the gnarly thing about data export. So the way this got on the backlog is that some somebody walked in to the sales office and said, I will give you this giant bag of money if you implement uh, data export. Yeah. And so the salesman comes in and says, I've got a picture here of a giant bag of money. And we can own that bag of money if we give data export. So everybody gets excited. Let's build data export. 
And so now we're off and running and we've got it. And we, we, how hard can this be? We're going to take data. We're going to export it. I mean, this is not very hard, but the question is, why are we exporting data? Are we exporting data because we want to make a backup of our data? I mean, that's reasonable. That's a, that's a good reason. Are we exporting data because uh, the New York office is running great and I want to create the LA office and the LA office should have the same sort of data schema that the New York office has. Why well, invent things twice? So let's just export it and start over with the LA office. Okay. Well, that's different than backup, right? With backup, I need a restore capability. With, with creating a new instantiation, I need the ability to actually strip all the data out and just keep the metadata. That's a completely different problem. Yeah. Right? Or maybe the reason that we need to export data is that um, we are going to uh, 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 we're we're going to import it into another app to do to do some manipulation of it. So we mm -hmm. just so that does that mean we need to export all the data or just some of the data? Do we need to transform the data in some way? I mean, there, there's some questions here about what this is. And what yeah. is the app, by the way? Oh, I can tell you what the app is. The app is Excel. It's always Excel. And so they're going to load this, this software, the data into Excel, and they're going to manipulate it. What are they going to do in Excel? They're going to produce charts. Why are they producing charts? Because they want to prove to management that they're making progress on the amount of data that they have. So why aren't we giving them charts? Why are we doing data export at all? Why are we not giving some sort of dashboard to management to show how great the data is? Yep. Right. So, so if we understand the problem better, we can improve their life even better. Yep. And so now the real question is, how well do we understand the problem? It's not how well are we good at design? That's the easy part. Yeah. It's how well do we understand the problem? And that's where we can be beneficial. Do we really okay. understand the problem and can we match it to outcomes? And so if we can create that feedback loop, what is the current experience? And when we ship something, how does that change people's lives? We will be able to see, and we can let them tinker to their heart's content until they figure out what the right set of things are in their design and maybe they'll ask for help but maybe they won't we can hope <laughs> right but if they don't ask for help it's going to take them a lot longer and that's their problem it is absolutely thank you that's good that's helpful <laughs> there you go okay Syra, i think we have time for one more let's take one more awesome um, okay, this question is from laura um, and she's asking how do you think about effectively measuring user satisfaction when users can oh no Tyra, where'd you go again oh no okay I'm you sorry. got halfway through the question okay. how, how, how do you think about effectively measuring user satisfaction is what we heard yes when users continue to become habituated and desensitized to incremental improvement um, to products that they once valued there we sorry go. my wife has been funky all day okay well we got it out uh laura are you here I'm here. Um, thank you, by the way, for, for giving this talk. It's really enlightening. Um, I'm a lead user researcher at a larger um, healthcare company that works on reducing the amount of friction, especially in um, collections and other things like medical record keeping. Um, and one thing I'm looking at right now is just thinking about what success for users is going to look like long term, something we, we do measure. But I'm just curious, you know, as things improve over time and we continue to make incremental improvements through these agile processes. Um, sometimes improvements end up being table stakes tomorrow. So, so users get used to them because it's the new normal and, and uh, you know, today's innovation is kind of tomorrow's table stakes. So just curious if you have any insight on gauging like true satisfaction over time with, with users when their own metric is sort of changing over time. Well, one thing is, is that satisfaction is not an interesting metric at all. So we, we can just start there and, and say that that's not, that's not what we care about. Um, we don't care whether people are satisfied. It's so funny that we've adopted this as a metric and it's only in, um, in product that we ever talk about satisfied, right? Do you, 
nobody, for instance, has a conversation at home about, so did you find dinner satisfactory? Uh, uh, was your play date satisfactory, right? This, this, is not, this is not something we care about. What we care about are, are other things, right? Was dinner delicious, right? Satisfaction, by the way, is a neutral um, uh, measure, right? When someone is satisfied, they're neither frustrated nor delighted. They're just, you know, if you, if, if you, you know, was this, was this session satisfactory to you, right? It's not that interesting uh, a thing. What I wanna know from tonight is did you learn something interesting? Are you going to change the way you do work in the future? Uh, are you more interested in these sorts of topics than you were when you started, right? These are things that I'd wanna measure. So, so I, we, I never focus on satisfaction. I wanna focus on the outcomes. What are the outcomes? And the outcomes, uh, while they may be easier to achieve in the future if we do our job right, um, they never get not interesting. And so we can, we can look at the outcomes. And the other thing is, as we learn more about the user's experience, we actually learn more about how uh, there are new things that we can get even more improvement for in their life, and we can have even better outcomes. And so we don't have to really worry about this problem of people losing interest in something because it's become habit, right? I mean, to some extent, you're absolutely right. There are things that go from being delightful at one point to being basic uh, uh, expectations the next, right? It used to be uh, back in the days when, when Wi-Fi was a new thing, that if I went into a, a, a hotel to stay for the night and they had Wi-Fi, that was really cool. There weren't that many hotels that had Wi-Fi. And if they didn't charge a lot of money for it, that was even cooler, right? Uh, now, if I go to a hotel, I, I expect to get free Wi-Fi. If it's not free Wi-Fi, I get pissy. And it better be fast enough to run Netflix. And, and, and I'm going to be... Uh, um, uh, uh, very unhappy if I can't check my email and catch up on, um, I don't know, what's on Netflix these days. And so uh, uh, that's going to, um, uh, that's, that's where I'm at with that. So there is this instance where something that used to be something that delighted me I now just assume is going to happen. But that doesn't mean that you can't make my life better, right? And so we're always looking for more improvements to, to focus the teams on. And that's really what the backlog should be. Imagine a backlog that was just filled with things we wanna to do to make people's lives better. And we let the teams actually have the autonomy to figure out what they're going to do to execute and get that. And so that, that would be sort of the ultimate of Agile UX and, and get to that point. Does that make sense, Laura? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. How does that help with what you're trying to do? Well, I mean, I think we have like some prioritization in the backlog, which is really fed into by what customers are telling us very honestly, like unstructured feedback, structured feedback. And I think um, it's like a good reminder to think about the fact the product is in name a product, but in the end, it is a set of features at some level also that are going to change over time. There's going to be new needs. Um, the careers of these people are changing. We're leveraging these products. So at some level, I think I agree with you that um, like satisfaction is, is not, you know, too exciting of a measure, especially when it, you know, you're not sure what exactly satisfaction means as the job is changing. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, satisfaction is an amorphous measure. I can be completely satisfied one day because it just worked and I can be completely dissatisfied the next day because I'm just having a really crappy day and this thing is not working my way. And the functionality didn't change one little bit. 
and you know there are all sorts of things i remember um we did this study we were trying to understand brands and how brands worked and we were asking people about restaurant experiences and we had this one woman who there was this restaurant in newton that that everybody loves and she absolutely hated it and she told us that the reason she hated it was because she'd once had a blind date there and the guy was horrible and that was her whole reason for never wanting to go to that restaurant again and that um uh those types of factors play into any sort of satisfaction measure so you never know what you're actually measuring and two people who come up with the same score are actually reporting very different things. And two people who are having the same experience might report very different uh, numbers in their satisfaction rating. So these things are not useful. So in, in my experience, you just avoid them and you focus on behaviors and you look for how can we tell when someone has actually had their life improved? how can we tell what that looks like and look for those behaviors and that's that's where i would focus okay that we've come to the end of our time here i want to take a moment and then i'll turn it back over to uh joe and and peter uh uh to to wrap up but i just want to thank you all for coming and staying and being a part of this i want to thank you for uh encouraging my behavior and ask if you're interested to, to join us in our Leaders of Awesomeness community and uh, be a part of uh, our Audacious UX Goals Intensive next week if this is something that you found interesting. We're gonna go into way more depth on all the things I talked about tonight over the next week. So if you're really interested in that, come for, to that. It's free, you just have to give us uh, uh, six hours of your time over six days so I think we could probably make that work. So thank you for being a part of that. And in the meantime, uh, Joe, uh, thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Jared. This is a fantastic talk and inspiring. And uh, I know for me, it helps me remember, like, what am I doing here? <laughs> so um, yeah, thanks everybody for coming out tonight. And um, yeah, I'll turn it over to Peter to close things out. Well, thank you, Joe, and thank you, Jared, for a great talk. Uh, I'm sure you've found a lot of people who are who you'll see again next week who want to get their uh, their other questions answered and more insights into how to build great UX systems. And with that, I hope to see at least some of you at our meeting in February if you want to find out about some of the uh, uh, work going on in new uh in new areas uh like bioinformatics and uh and, and other areas of computing uh feel free to join us at some of our talks as well and then again i hope to see both you and some of our audience again next year around this time for the next uh edition of your annual talk, talk, talk to the joint meeting of our groups sure we can make that happen and thanks everyone for coming tonight. Thank you everybody. Go make some awesomeness. <laughs>